I'm going to talk very briefly about two of the AgriFutures projects we've got running. Uh, the utilization of synthetic amino acids, that's complete, that we've completed that one. And right now we're worried about the branch chain amino acids or valine, leucine and isoleucine. And in a nutshell, what we are worried about reduced crude protein diets, we'd like to develop them successfully. And the reason for that is that we, we want to make sure we get sustainable chicken meat production. So just to put some skeleton on the bones, uh, in 2008-9, Australia produced 833,000 tonnes of dead chook. 10 years later, in 2018-19, Australia produced 1.24 million tonnes. So that's an increase of 48.9% in that 10 year period. In that same period, per capita consumption jumped from 35.5 kilos per capita to 47.4. So the, the chicken meat market in Australia is thriving, but this is also a global deal because back in 2012, FAO made a projection and if that projection is valid, global chicken meat production will increase, will increase from 106 million tonnes now to 181 million tonnes in 2050. Now that's a 71% increase in global production. And I think if anything, that projection is probably already looking conservative. So, okay, the fundamental question is what is a reduced crude protein diet? And why are we interested? Well, a crude protein diet, a reduced crude protein diet is going to contain 16, 17, 18% crude protein rather than say 21%. And as a result of that, we're going to have more feed grain, be it wheat or sorghum in this country. We're going to have less protein meal, which is predominantly soya bean meal. And we're going to have more non-bound synthetic or crystalline amino acids, be they methionine, lysine, threonine, tryptophan, valine, and so on. So if you want to look at a hardcore example, in one of our studies, we reduced the crude protein content of the diet from 21.5% down to 17.2%. And in so doing, the maize inclusion rate jumped from 543 up to 714 grams per kilogram. Soya bean came back from 355 down to 195 grams per kilogram. And the quantity of non-bound amino acids increased from 4.5 kilos per tonne to 21.5 kilos per tonne. Now, the interesting thing in this is that as your feed grain is going up, and your soya bean meals coming down, your starch to protein, your dietary starch to protein ratio increases. And in this particular example, the, the dietary, the analyzed dietary starch protein ratio jumped from 1.45 to 2.3. And as I'll come back to it, uh, we don't think that is a good look. Okay, so why are we interested in reduced crude protein diets? There's a number of reasons. Reduced crude protein diets are going to reduce environmental pollution with both nitrogen and ammonia. That might not be a big ticket item in Australia, but nitrogen pollution in Europe, in Germany, and, in, and the Netherlands particularly, most certainly is a big ticket item. Reduced crude protein diets will give you better litter quality. And that means less foot pad lesions, less uh, breast blisters, burn hocks and so on. And that's increasingly a, an, an animal welfare issue. Reduced crude protein diets will give you less undigested protein flowing into the hind gut to fuel the, the proliferation of potentially pathogenic organisms, including Clostridium perfringens, so it's got advantages there in terms of better flock health. And I can only imagine that with economies of scale, the, the uh, cost of a lot of these uh, peripheral, if you like, non-bound amino acids are going to come backwards. Soybean meal is, all, is almost always certainly going to go up 
And I think in the long run, these diets will be more profitable. But to me, and I think to the Australian chicken meat industry, the big ticket item, a really important item is soya bean meal. And we feel that if we can successfully develop crude protein, reduce crude protein diets, we could reduce the local industry's dependence on soya bean meal by up to 50%. Now, the extraordinary thing is, is that in 1990, Australia imported 40,000 tonnes of soya bean meal. This year, Australia is going to import nearly 1.2 million tonnes. And most of that, 60% or so, perhaps more, will go to the poultry industry. So from 1990 to 2020, the average annual increase in soya bean meal importations is very nearly 12%. Now, I don't see that as being particularly sustainable. Um, and, and to make matters worse, the cost of soya bean meal right now is approaching $700 per tonne. And when you think uh, that a starter diet's going to contain about 32% soya bean meal, that is a hell of a lot of money. So in round figures for every 1%, very round figures, for every one percentage unit or 10 grams per kilogram crude protein you pull backwards, there's going to be about a 10% reduction in soya bean meal inclusions. Now we feel we can get a two or 3% reduction and the birds will behave perfectly well, perform entirely satisfactorily and that alone would reduce our soya bean meal dependence by 20 to 30 percent but we're trying we're trying to get to uh, a five percentage unit reduction that would reduce our soya bean meal dependence by 50 percent or in other words we could we could produce just as much chicken meat now without any further increase in imported expensive soya bean meal so just to reiterate, I think we can reduce crude protein from 21% from down to about 18%. Perhaps we'll even get better performance. Um, and particularly if we make sure that our glycine and serine or glycine equivalents are up around 15 uh, grams per kilogram. However, we're still facing this problem. If we reduce the crude protein levels down to about 16% or so, then we normally see FCRs are compromised, abdominal fat pad weights get heavier, and we, what we certainly see is that free threonine uh, concentrations in blood, in blood plasma are absolutely skyrocket. And right now, I guess our thinking is that threonine, glycine and serine, and the branch chain amino acids are probably of pivotal importance amongst the amino acids. And like it or not, and we've shown this in our AgriFutures projects without, beyond doubt, like it or not, maize is a far better feed grain for a reduced crude protein diet than wheat. There's a marked difference. Now, we're not totally sure why that is. What we can tell you is that wheat has got a higher protein level than maize. We all know that. But because of that, non there are more non-bound amino acids in a reduced crude protein wheat-based diet, and there's less soya bean meal in a reduced crude protein wheat-based diet. Now, those two factors, I'm sure, are playing a part. The other factor is that wheat has a faster starch digestion rate than maize. Now, in vitro, uh, wheat has twice the digestion rate of maize starch. In vivo, the difference is not as marked, but it could be important. Bearing in mind that starch obviously is converted to glucose and is absorbed as glucose, and glucose in turn will promote insulin secretion from the pancreas. Now, that's where we've got a problem, Houston, because we're not sure about insulin in avian species. You could take a, a chook, a 
and a chook is effectively a type two diabetic. Very high plasma glucose levels, resistant or unresponsive to insulin. So one of the questions, one of the, the, the elephant in the room type question is that on the one hand, slowly digestible starch may promote net protein synthesis via a more sustained release of insulin. That will occur in pigs. The big question is, does that obtain to poultry? And I think it's a question that should be addressed and I would, I would issue the caveat that it might be a very dry gully. This is our, our next trial, our next feeding study in the, the branch chain amino acid project. Uh, we're taking the line that, okay, maize is similar to sorghum. Uh, you know, sorghum is similar to maize. So sorghum's got, like maize, it's got a lower crude protein content. It's got a very similar amino acid profile. It's also got, uh, relative to wheat, it's also got slow starch digestion rates. So what we want to do, what we will run starting the 24th of September is a three by three factorial where we'll have three regimes of branch chain amino acids and three feed grain regimes. So we'll have wheat based diets, sorghum-based diets and diets based on a 50-50 blend. And with the branch chain amino acids, we'll have leucine, isoleucine and valine at low levels, 105, 65 and 75. They're, they're all very conservative. Then we're going to bump up the leucine to 150 without adjusting isoleucine and valine. And then we're going to bump the leucine up to 150, but increase isoleucine and valine. And the hypothesis here, untested, the hypothesis is that broiler chickens will benefit from a higher leucine levels than standard. This is certainly the case in pigs, if not poultry. But on account of branch chain amino acid antagonisms, we feel that we'll also have to ramp up isoleucine and valine to realize those advantages. So sometime in October, we'll have a much better idea about that. The other thing we're looking at, and this is why we're interested in the wheat v starch situation, is that we're forming the opinion that perhaps starch is the nemesis of reduced crude, reduced crude protein diets and that uh, what you don't want is wide dietary starch to protein ratios. And in uh, an initial study, which was an agri-future study in the last project, well, this is the basis of our thinking. As you can see, as this is dietary, analyzed dietary starch protein ratios from two studies. And as those ratios increase, feed conversion ratios obviously go to hell in a handbasket. So our thinking is, hey, let's limit the increase in starch in a reduced crude protein diet and maybe we'll, we'll see better outcomes. And to a limited extent, that's exactly what we did uh, in this study uh, of Shiva's and we compared um, uh, a 19.75% crude protein wheat-based diet with dietary starch protein ratios of either 1.41 or 1.68. And the lower ratio gave us a 10% advantage in weight gain, a 3% uh, higher feed intake, and we were better off by 4% in feed conversion. And also the uh, starch protein disappearance rate ratio in the ileum in the birds contracted in line with the dietary starch protein ratios. So there are the exact figures. I won't dwell on them, but it's interesting to note that the birds on the 19.75 crude protein diet with the capped starch protein ratio numerically outperformed the positive control birds on the 21.5% diet. So, 
the, the obvious question becomes, well, okay, if capping starch, dietary starch protein ratios is good, how do we do it? And in my view, that's a very good question. One way, I think the ideal way would be to replace soybean meal with full fat soy. That way we won't compromise protein quality, but by virtue of the fact that full fat soy contains 36% protein, as opposed to 48% protein in soya bean meal, we will reduce the, um, the crude protein of the diet without increasing the feed grain inclusion. We can also look at canola meal, whole canola seed, field peas. I think we're particularly interested in feed field peas because they have both a much lower protein content and also a slowly digestible starch component. And the next question is, is how much should you cap dietary starch protein ratios? Well, I guess our feeling is that if you go back to the graph from the two studies by Peter Crystal, is that there is some wriggle room. I think we can increase the feed grain to a point and the birds will tolerate that. We just don't want to go too high and perhaps by uh, replacing soya bean meal with protein sources of lesser protein, uh, lesser crude protein uh, uh, amounts, and at the same time letting the feed grain level increase by a little bit rather than a lot. Uh, I think perhaps we can cap the starch. We I think we would be able to cap the dietary starch protein ratios, and I would like to think we'd get very much better bird performance on. Um, on reduced crude protein diets. So, but that's what we're looking for, sustainable chicken meat production and perhaps reduced crude protein diets are the holy grail. And I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like to thank AgriFutures for their, uh, their support. And I'd also like to thank Avonik who have also been supporting our efforts in, in this area. So thank you.